I want to introduce myself to get started. I think we already kind of um, got to know a couple people in the chat. I saw we had people from Kentucky, a lot of people who see themselves. We have Freedom Dreamer, Freedom Builder, a working class revolutionary. Some people talked about um, how their identity impacts how, who they are as a revolutionary. Um, for me, uh, introducing myself, I'm an educator in Chicago, a Chicago public school teacher and high school, a neighborhood high school. And um, I have worked with Chicago Teachers Union. I've organized uh, students to join us in the 2019 strike, up to 20 students joined us daily and also um, organized with students to make films. So filmmaking is very much hierarchical and we have worked to disrupt that by making our films collaborations between young people and professionals and educators. I also worked with, with students and educators to get cops out of our school, which was, there was a big push for that a few years ago and we were successful here. Um, for some of you who came on early too, I'm also a mom of a six month old and an almost 15 year old. And um, I'm really excited to be here to learn from you all and um, to, to have some, some things to think about as I leave here on this, um, on this Friday night. And uh, as we always do, we wanna recognize that we're on unceded indigenous land. And so I acknowledge here in Chicago, I'm on the Council of Three Fires, which is Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, as well as a lot of other tribes that were here. But, beyond land acknowledgements, having these actual conversations with revolutionaries about what we're gonna do, that's how we really like honor indigenous people. It's not just saying where we're at. It's like, what are we gonna do next for all of the indigenous activists who are still here and still fighting? And then I'm gonna pass it on over to uh, Anthony to introduce himself and tell you about this organization that you're meeting with right now. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, my name is Anthony Jackson. I am an assistant professor at Bowie State University. It's an HBCU in Bowie, Maryland. Um, I'm also the program coordinator there, so I'm in the charge of the curriculum redevelopment. I am a scholar activist and a revolutionary at heart, so the curriculum structure is taking that form of revolutionary education. And um, I'm also a director of the prison education program. So at Bowie State, uh, we have a um, baccalaureate degree program in sociology where uh, incarcerated individuals in Jessup, Maryland have an opportunity to earn a bachelor's degree in sociology at Bowie State. And so, um, you know, when I when I think about the work that I do in the academy, um, it really isn't far away from the work that I do in the league, right? Um, and I think of the League of Revolutionaries for New America as uh, an organization really designed and in, in there as, as um, uplifting, empowering working class people to establish working class unity. Um, and it's a political home. Oftentimes in the academy or in our respective jobs, um, you know, we don't really have an outlet uh, politically and the League really is an organization designed to um, really put you around family um, that really are, are, are have the hearts for liberation. And I think that's the most important thing, right? Having a heart for liberation in a world that is designed for conformity and oppression um, doesn't really go over well. So having a organization that is designed to empower you in liberation movements is really, really important. And so that's who the league is. Yeah, and I'll also say we have a, a paper called Rally uh, Rally Comrades is the website right now. I think it's, is it rallycomrades.org? Somebody tell me, put it in the chat. Um, but I, that might be changing. So you can always go to leagueofrevolutionaries.org to, to see our work um, further, as well as follow us on social media. Um, a couple community agreements. Well, while what we're aiming for is a safe space, right? And we can't guarantee that, but that's what we aim for. And we really wanna hear any new voices that are here. And we wanna prioritize and center those voices because we really believe that it's important to speak out that that's a revolutionary act, but listening can, listening can also be a revolutionary act. I am gonna personally bring my curiosity and I hope that you all will as well. We wanna respect each other's pronouns um, and also know that we can speak and say things and decide that those are not what we believe 10 minutes later, right? That we can speak as our first draft and that learning requires vulnerability. So um, I appreciate you all being here and being vulnerable and sharing your voices with us. Uh, on the note of appreciation, I really wanna shout out our tech team. There's a lot of revolutionary work that happens behind the scenes. So um, 
Peter and, and uh, Alan and Joyce, thank you for your work as well as Walda. Um, we all have different roles to play in the revolution and so you all are much appreciated. They will be helping manage the chat. Um, they might be direct messaging you if you say something beautiful in the chat. So look out for that. Our agenda today is 90 minutes total. There'll be two questions that we ask. There'll be about 30 minutes each and we'll go to a third if time allows. We also wanna let the conversation flow naturally. So we're gonna see what happens and Anthony and I will be here as facilitators to make things easier and, and really guide the way. We ask that people limit um, their speaking till three minutes. And I'll give you a gentle reminder if you've gone past three minutes with, with Anthony's help on that as well as the tech team's help. And then lastly, before we get started and Anthony introduces the questions, we have an evaluation at the end that, um, that we're gonna drop the link in the chat. Please do take, it'll take less than five minutes, fill that out. It's important to us that we're hearing from people, we're seeing what works and what doesn't work and continuing to build these events so that people feel safe and good and that um, you know your brain is working. So um, Anthony, get us started on our, on our question. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Can you hear me well? Somebody needs to mute out. Are we cool? I hear you. Okay, cool. Yeah, you sound fine, Anthony. Yeah, okay. Yolanda needs to be muted if someone on the tech team can mute Yolanda. I think mm -hmm. she's she said she was having trouble and so her connection's coming in and out. Oh, I apologize. Um, so our first question, um, major question, what does it mean to you to be a revolutionary in this moment, right? And you can raise your hand by using reactions, which is generally at the bottom of the screen, and I will call on you. So what does it mean to be a revolutionary in this moment? It's also written in the chat. You wanna model it? <laughs> sure, sure, I, I sure will. Um, yeah, so, you know, when we were thinking about having this event, I really sat and, uh, you know, the team got together and we were really trying to figure out like what this moment needs, what questions do we want to ask? Um, and this, this question, the second question really spoke to our hearts and it kept on echoing over and over again, because, um, really of what's going on in the world, right? Um, it's so much death and destruction that's happening around us. And so the question becomes, um, we look at past revolutionary movements, we look at past revolutionaries, and we know that uh, some of the things that they fought for historically, right, are now being peeled back now, right? Um, and so the question becomes, now in this new moment, what do revolutions look like and what do revolutionaries look like? And so when I ask myself that question, and it's such it's such a great question that forced me to go, and not in an oppressive kind of way, but more in an introspective kind of way, go to a very vulnerable place. Um, and for me, I think the heart of being a revolutionary is, and it sounds cliche, but really having a love for liberation. And then I had to question, what does liberation look like, right? Um, what does it look like for people to be free? What does it look like for people to explore, have the freedom to explore their own autonomy? What does it look like for people to be creative? What does it look like for people, um, for us that have certain privileges or certain opportunities, create a space um, where other people can share in those privileges, where people can share in those opportunities? Um, and so now how do I as a professor create um, an environment where people can learn um, about themselves, learn about their struggles. And I think for me, like a, a revolutionary today has to be an empowerer, right? Um, we have to ignite sparks in people um, that are infectious. We have to inspire people. And so when I think about what it means, um, what it means for, for me to be a revolutionary. It's a constant charge for me to use all that I am, all that I've learned, right? And all that I can do 
to really inspire and create that spark in people um, that leads them to want to engage in revolution, right? That leads them to want to engage in, in uh, liberation struggles. Um, so yeah, pass. Beautifully said, thank you. Michelle. Hey, well, I'm gonna uh, show myself. I don't look great today, but. <laughs> Um, my name is Michelle Snyder. I'm a revolutionary journalist. As a matter of fact, I got into journalism um, in order to be able to tell the stories that are going on currently and also interweave the history, um, as well as um, right now I've been into philosophy in order for us to think about, like, what can we, th you know, think about things that people haven't thought before because I think that the moment we're having right now and the biggest issue we've had is people don't want change like the the opposition don't want revolution and they don't want change so they're always going to be like the message is you can't change things they've always been this way um there is they don't ever bring solutions so for me I see it as something where you look at the past you look at the present and you see this path and you start really contemplating and having foresight into what kind of future you're trying to create. And you work with your community, you listen to everyone around you because you're um, in philosophy. One of the things I, I really just makes me think all the time, because a lot of people say I, my perspective on things, right? It sounds smart, but um, in philosophy, I have been told that perspective is actually ignorance. It's it's a viewpoint out of ignorance. It's not to say you're not smart. It's just saying that this is your viewpoint. And so a lot of times that could be very narrow. So until you find the research and the facts and, and all of that, you're not really actually bringing too much to the table other than another viewpoint. Um, and I think that um, Anthony really said it eloquently that also... Um, just from what I'm getting at is that you have to really look inside yourself and um, a revolutionary is not going to be able to continue doing work for the community and everything they want to do if they don't take care of themselves. So I feel like that is um, essential that a lot of times we feel like we have to burn ourselves down because we want to make things happen now. Um, but this is something that is happening throughout our whole entire life. So um, a revolutionary should never feel bad if they need to take a day off and they need to think and they need to take care of what's going on with all the thoughts in their brain and all of the trauma they may have experienced. So that's <laughs> my viewpoint there. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. That's what's up. That's right. Um, hey, Sue. Sorry, I keep getting the size of I'm not going to be as eloquent as y'all. I've, I've had a really long week. Um, I'm in Chicago and the, you know, the political scene is hopping and, um, but I think just seeing what's happening with different groups that as a revolutionary, uh, I'm way more fearless than I was before. Uh, and, and, um, that, that's important in, in any context. But the other thing is as, as a leveled up revolutionary, I'm all about unity right now and getting people to come together and it's not easy, right? So how do we bring in people who supported Chewy, you know, into this movement that's blossoming? Um, and, and so, but unity, unity is the battle cry, right? But practicing in daily life is my, my new thing. So that's it. Thank you. Anthony, do you wanna read the question again? Yeah, for sure. Um, so what we're, trying to figure out is what does it mean to you to be a revolutionary in this moment? And I think you're also talking about like, what, what does it require? Like, you know, how does, how does love connect to it? How do you define yourself as a revolutionary? How do you define revolutionary? Any of those things? We have something in the chat. Anthony, do you want to read it? Yeah. Keep your eyes on the prize. I'm a tenant organizer in Kentucky, and there's a lot of things that need to be better for tenants. We fight for those things, but we have to remember that the prize revolutionary, remember, is making sure our basic needs aren't commodities anymore, but freely, socially available to all who need. The needs are many, and all needs can be met right now if we 
completely overhaul social distribution. It's powerful. Yeah, that's really powerful. I, I have been thinking about my answer a lot and a couple of things that people have said had, has um, helped me to kind of think through it a little bit more, which is I think that what it requires to be a revolutionary now might be different than in the past. I mean, some of the things remain the same, but I think really working towards making the messages accessible. And as a high school teacher, I think that that's a skill that I'm, I may possess and that I want to continue to work on. Um, and also making you know things visual and, and people being able to find an entryway into difficult thoughts because just, you know, there is so much wisdom in the working class, but sometimes the language can be um, really isolating. And so how can we make that language understandable to people? Um, and then the other thing, I totally agree with Michelle, like how are we teaching people to take care of themselves and to take care of each other? Because that has to be a part of, of our movement. Like how, how are we saying, you're not gonna run yourself down. Some of y'all have been in this, this, this struggle for 50 years, right? How are we going to, to hold each other and to know when we have to step back and take care of ourselves and take care of our community? So I, to me, I think that that's what it means to be a revolutionary and, and you know, I'm not, I'm still working on all those things, right? Um, do we have any other hands on, on this question or any other thoughts on this question? And it's okay if you don't directly answer the question, maybe your brain went somewhere else. That's great. All right, I see Steven, go ahead. You're muted. I, I certainly agree with what you were saying, uh, Sam, that uh, we're still learning. I'm not a youth anymore, but I am an ex-youth. And uh, I find that it's even more challenging. <laughs> But for me, what a revolutionary means these days is to be able to have the uh, strategic discussions that are behind most of our movements, usually in the movement, we're fighting so hard just to deal with the powers that be and how they manipulate stuff. I'm in Oakland, and uh, they're just murdering the school board uh, because they dared to rescind closing schools, only six, uh, and they are just getting dragged from pillar to post. Uh, there's no time to think about anything. But without the understanding of these forces that are against us and how they operate, we're just not going to win anything. And I really do think that we can fight and win, but we're going to have to fight smart. Uh, and another thing that I think is really happening in this uh digital age is that we're seeing the rise of a meta discussion. It isn't just discussing the events. It's the discussion about the events. It's kind of like watching a football game. People watch the play and then they want to hear what all the commentators say. And that becomes more important than the play. And right now the meta discussion is just fueled by uh, social media. And uh, it sounds like the fascists are dominant in that. Uh, because that's who, who gets amplified by the corporate media. But we can see from stuff like Kansas, uh, there was a vast meta discussion going on before uh, the Kansas election and after it. Uh, and this is where revolutionaries can really thrive. Thank you. Um, please correct me if I say your name wrong. Hepsiba? Hi, Hepsiba. Hey. <laughs> hey, Anthony. Hi, friends. Hi, Jerome. It's nice to see you. Uh, you know, I want to say, I mean, I recently got kicked out of my job, so I'm trying to figure out what my next pathway is going to be. But I know, Walda, we got to catch up. But uh, <laughs> um, but I have I have realized that in the past as a teacher, I was so focused on like the difference between facts and ideologies and really feeling like the way in towards the revolution was to deliver the facts. And I still very much feel that is true, but I've had to take a, take a step back and realize that they now just need care before absolutely anything because they are disconnected on social media. Their families have gone through so much trauma in the last few years. The, the violence in the schools, the shootings, the police brutality, the global warming, the complete disregard just for humanity in general. 
they don't feel anyone cares about them. So that very makes them feel very individualized in their experience, right? And so then they're like, I need to pay my bills, take care of my child, right? And keep it pushing. And you can't be a revolutionary unless you have a community orientation. And so I have found that most of my investment these days is it just showing care. I care about you. I want to know what's happening in your personal life. I see you as a human being. And then we can move on to like a broader conversation from that point. But that's why I said more and more like caretaker. I feel like any in any number of ways you want to construe that, but it's becoming more central to uh, what I see as necessary. Yeah, Brother, before oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Brother, before we jump to you, I I because I I think that this this commonality in this thread of self care and of community, right, and um just inspiring and so on. I I want to you know kind of raise this. What is love's role in being a revolutionary? Like, what does love have to do with anything, right? What does love look like? How do we express love? And what is its relationship to liberation in, in this uh, revolutionary struggle? Walda. So I guess you were channeling Tina Turner, huh? What's, what's love got to do with that? Um, it is a woman's name. So, <laughs> right, right. I mean, People are really talking and raising things about community and love and caring and how we as individuals feel the energy of being a revolutionary. And the only thing I want to add is that we need to figure out the collective forms of how we as revolutionary and loving individuals create the community and the political collectivity, right? So that we can together, you know, transform, right? Abolish the, the, you know, kill capitalism before it kills us. And so I think that to me in this moment, as opposed to other moments and times, it really is revolutionaries across all kinds of spaces and generations and differences, figuring out how we come together to be that political force, right? So that we can have the kind of quiet, restful, and, you know, society and world where the earth's needs are met and where our kids and our grandkids and our grandparents' needs are met. So to me, political revolutionary organization, and just a point of privilege, I worked with Sam and Anthony, right? And in, in you know, preparing for this. And you know, we're all you know very cool people, but together we came up with something that was had a different quality, right? And I so I think that the collectivity of revolutionaries um, as we express our individuality is really critically important. I'm gonna pass. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple great points that came up in the chat. I'm wondering, they're just to me a little bit more powerful if we hear them out loud. There's something from Rita and then Shania, if I'm saying it correctly, Shania. Shania, yeah. Shania, if either of you wanted to share those out loud, I, I think it, it would be powerful to hear what you said as opposed to having just me read it. But if you just want to keep it in the chat, you, you can do that as well. Shania, oh. do you want to go ahead? And <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, I can I can share um, what I wrote. Um, can everyone, everyone can hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I, what I wrote was, I'll just read what it says. I said, a revolutionary today is someone who moves with love in everything they do. Um, it's easy to get caught up in uh, what's done to us. Um, there's a lot of things intellectually and, and physically that, that harm us that we see every day. But when what, what truly moves us forward is when we put love at the center of everything we do. And in addition to that, um, you have to be able to be comfortable in what you're afraid of, your fears, um, not knowing what's gonna happen, 
Um, and then also being able to just practice humanity with your community. Those things are just as important as walking with love. And and um, I was actually typing a little bit when you guys asked me to read that. Uh, I was saying, um, you can't be liberated without love and you can't liberate. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I should have just sent it off <laughs> it sounded a lot better in my head as i was typing at as i just did coming out of my mouth but uh basically yeah there's there's no liberation without love and there's no love without liberation so the the two go hand in hand i don't think um if if you don't know how to love yourself um you you can't truly love the community that you you want to serve or you say you want to serve um but self-love is a a journey in itself that it's not to say that you still can't participate in the community or or help or reach out but once you do get to a point of of self-realization it will help you that much more to serve your community that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> that was beautiful. Yeah, I think this question of how is love liberatory and what Michelle said in the chat, love is really hard when you realize what it is. We were talking about bell hooks and all about love and just thinking about like, how do we love under capitalism? I think it's really, really hard both to love yourself and to live in existing community when there's so much competition. And I think that as revolutionaries, we have to really also know that that's what we're up against, right? That like this idea of care does have to lead because if we're not caring for each other, I mean, life under capitalism is not life designed for humans, right? Um, I think Walda had said we're endangered. And I, and I like, I think about that all the time now of how, how we really are endangered. Um, Anthony, oh, Rita, please. Well, I, I guess I feel a little like I need to say something as a registered nurse, know a little bit about care and um, uh, two things, just just two things to add to the wonderful things that uh, comrades have already said. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Sam and Anthony and everybody that put this together. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank uh, Michael and the sister that just spoke for their um, insightful um, comments. And um, I, I want to talk just from a personal point of view that the two things I love the most is uh, science and people. And science, uh, I, I think so much, I think it's so important to understand that society is knowable, because if we don't know where we are, we don't know how to get to where we need to be. And so I think that's very, very important part. And um, as, as Anthony said, you know, part of our responsibility is inspiration. It's also revolutionary joy. Uh, and that joy comes from the, the, the opportunity we now have to create the kind of society that is necessary for both humanity and uh, other species and the planet to survive. So there's a combination kind of, of uh, urgency, uh, uh, necessity, and patience, because it takes patience to unite our class uh, and to understand uh, what class actually is, which I think is an important part of understanding it and the pillars that capitalism uses to keep us divided and how we combat those pillars in the process of uh, building an organization. And the last thing I wanted to say was also thank Walda for her comment about the necessity for a uh, revolutionary political organization. Uh, I think that that grows uh, by the minute. And uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, and last thing, care. Yeah, you got to take care of yourself. But care is a societal act. OK, and and I think we have to understand that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Some hearts and a big heart from me. Thank you. Uh, D, you're up next. Hi, my name is Dee from Chicago. Um, yeah, I think part of how I would answer this question is talking about like, I think it's two part, like changing my timeline on what change or revolution when, when that happens. And then I think also like um, moving from an 
outward perspective of change to an inward perspective of change. Uh, I think I'm in a place where I think it's actually really ineffective to change someone's mind um, uh, unless like, I don't know, they will know we are Christians by our love. I think you have to show what revolution is um, as one of the best tactics to transform uh, the world around you. And so I think I'm in a place where I'm like, okay, well, if I have to transform myself to be someone who wants to live in the world that I wanna live in, then that's gonna take a real long time. That's a lifetime. Um, and I think building community and solidarity with people who are interested in working on changing ourselves and building a, a kind of solidarity that starts at home, I think is kind of necessary right now. Yes, beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, and change takes time and reminding ourselves of that I think is really beautiful and important. Um, there's a couple good things happening in the chat. Um, when Michael yeah. or Stephen, do they want to uh, share? Jerome Stack. Awesome, Jerome. Got yeah, see, I got I my. Sorry about that. I got my I hand see, up, but it's I see hard you. To see. Listen, yeah, listen. I uh, I had already told them I am no expert at Zoom, so you've made a <laughs> fool of me, Jerome. No, go ahead, Jerome. <laughs> I certainly didn't intend that. <laughs> So I just want to say a couple of things. Um, on this question of why a revolutionary today, you know, the question in and of itself sort of indicates that there's something different about the day than it was, uh, you know, a little while ago or a long time ago. And I think the most important thing that is different today that makes us want to be a revolutionary in this moment is the fact that the world is in transition already. You know, you think about it, this whole transition in technology is causing the world to shift in every aspect of its existence, from the way we produce our goods and services, to the way we communicate, to the way that we care, you know, this whole question of care and how it takes place. And when, when, when we think about the world being in transition, and we think about history, you know, when, when have the most important revolutions taken place historically? Well, they've taken place when the world was in transition. This transition gives us the best moment for us to be successful in our revolutionary activity. And so it is a real privilege to be alive and be a revolutionary in this moment, you know, and, and, and I think it's just critical for us to understand how different that is than, than when I first became a revolutionary back in the 60s. Now, we thought that we were in a revolutionary time back then because things were changing, but things weren't fundamentally changing like they are today. They were changing in terms of our fight to make our, our situation, our daily existence a little better. You know, we were able to to make some changes in that. What, what we weren't able to do is actually change the capitalist system. What's happening today is the capitalist system is in the course of changing. You know, it, it's almost, you know, um, of course we don't wanna think that the capitalist system is gonna change in and of itself, but it's setting it up so that if we can, if we can mount this struggle to unite a section of the working class, we can push ourselves through and capitalism through this transition that it's going to. In the final analysis, we're the only people that can do it, the working class. You know, no one else is gonna do it for us. And this moment is a moment where we have, if we gather our strength collectively, we have a huge opportunity. The second point I wanted to make about this moment is this question, well, not so much about this moment, but really throughout history, this whole question of love. When I think about the relationship of love and revolution, I think about how difficult it is for revolution. I mean, revolution is not an easy thing. And I, when I think about the concept of love, what, it, what that teaches us is that whatever comes our way in this relationship, you know, in, in my case, I think about it as a love for my class. And whatever comes in 
the way of that love in, in terms of our ability to communicate with each other, our ability to fight for change together, our ability to be able to sustain all the lows and highs of the process, you know, the only concept that's the driving force strong enough to get you, get us through all that is this whole concept of love. Because we know that if we're going to survive, we have to be able to survive through the highs and the lows, through the struggle, through the celebrations, through the joyfulness of revolution, as well as through the critical moments of revolution. And love is that motive force that pushes us forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Um, let's call for any more on this question. What does it mean to be a revolutionary? Is there anybody else? Hi to people who came in late. I know some of you, good to see you. Um, if there's anyone else who has any thoughts on this, please put up your hand. I think I don't have any hands up now. Okay, you can always go back to this question if something comes up and you're ignited by someone else's thought, but I'm gonna pass to Anthony to share our second question. Yeah, so as we uh, talk about love, oh, sorry, I'm gonna put a time on, so you, you, you did. Uh, what does it mean practically in our day-to-day -day activity, right? Like what are these best practices for revolutionaries, right? Like. So it's also in the chat, what does it mean practically? What are our best practices as revolutionaries? We're kind of thinking about how we can like generate a list. So if you have a thought on that or the first question, um, John, I saw your hand go up and down. I don't know if you wanted to say anything on the last question. Question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was gonna okay. maybe make a quick comment about the last question because yeah, I'm like, I really like where this conversation is going and um, yeah, I'm really in like this reflective mode right now. And um, I guess like it, in a lot of ways, this conversation is like helping me also see that like starting with love is so crucial. Um, but like, you know, along with that, it's like using our revolution um to like recognize people's like frustrations or anger with the the capitalist system and like kind of using that love to kind of direct or shift some of those like angers or frustrations towards some of the maybe you know directing it towards the capitalist system or you know things that are actually causing those angers in the first place um because definitely the you know more like fascist state or or capitalist you know more neoliberal folks are trying to channel it in other ways um or towards you know dividing people and other things but i think it is like our role as revolutionaries to really channel that that anger and frustration towards towards actually changing the system. But yeah, that's that was my thank you. I'm glad I'm glad that you shared that. And I, you know, yeah, that isolation that people are experiencing, the fascists love that. They're grabbing up, particularly like poor white folks are really getting pulled into that. So I think that's a really important point to uplift is that how do we make people not feel isolated and, and included. Um, thank you. Uh, Michael. Yeah, um, on this day-to-day -day question, um, I've been thinking a lot about the uh, concept of accompaniment. Um, and I think, um, you know, day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, we organize, right? And we lick envelopes and, and knock on doors and and all of those things that are really important. But I also think that like we add flexibility in our days to accompany each other in our class, because I know like what hap what has happened to me, um, and and 
things like being evicted and stuff like that. But I only have like one little piece of the puzzle because our, our class is really diverse and lots of people in our class have experiences that I don't have. Um, so I've, I've not personally um, lived in an encampment where the police come and sweep and push everybody along. Um, but if we put ourselves in organizing relationships where we accompany each other um, and fight back when things like that happens, that helps, I think, all of us land our shift in consciousness. It helps people like me where I've not had this direct experience, but by being in the, in that situation with somebody who is having that direct experience, it changes my consciousness about what is what is happening with our class. Um, and I couldn't get that kind of understanding because I'm only personally one person, right? So I have to be in relationships of accompaniment and find ways to pull that off in my daily life so that all of us together get a better understanding of what all is happening in our class because we all occupy our own kind of unique positions within it and we want the biggest best picture of what's going on so we can come up with the biggest and best strategy to to defeat it. Thank you for sharing that. I I I you know, when you said I was reflecting in so many different ways um, and, you know, we we talk about what it means to be woke quite often. And um, part of the, the argument is that um, being woke actively involves true solidarity. And we know that true solidarity means being in the condition with those in which who are oppressed, right? Um, so it's a constant um, placing ourselves in relation to people that are experiencing all of these ills um, that's capitalism is just inherently engenders right and when, when uh john i i appreciate what you said so much because my mind went back to um bell hooks killing rage right and she was talking about how you know black folks feel rage from racism racial oppression in all of these different ways and really how um that rage is is then by the institution articulated as pathological right when when it then strips away the opportunity opportunity for that rage to be or to be recognized as an appropriate response to exploitation and oppression, right? And how when we can harness um, this rage as um, a, a, an act against this exploitation and oppression we, we experience, when we make it militant, right? When we make it militant, then it has such a great chance of really producing love right act being in relation to one another um and acting together to produce to, to towards liberation really produces love that's when an expression of love can be found and you know i i just appreciate what y'all both said because um i think it's really important and it's practical right it's something that we can actively do we can partner and link arms with one another um pass Yes, beautiful. Uh, Steve. Mute, there. Uh, you know, as people were talking about um, uh, love, I was thinking, I was putting in the chat, I worked with a lot of inner city youth who uh, um, they were impoverished, they were endangered on a lot of different levels. They called themselves homies and formed youth groups, and we all see in the media, whether it's called gangs or whatever. But one of the words that section of youth used much more than most sections of youth was love. Love you, man. Much love. God love you. It's in the music, the hip hop music of that sector, replete with it. People would be talking love as they're also talking about some of the violent stuff that might happen and how to deal with it. But I think hearing this discussion it made me really think. They clearly had shared problems, and they, those folks had, had come together because they saw they couldn't solve some degree of those problems by themselves. And it's interesting, at one point, there were the African-American homies were totally separate from the Mexican homies, Mexican homies separated from the Salvador, and that, a lot of ideology. But the more their circumstances got worse, the more those um, walls to recruitment came down and they started coming together and you see 
I'm not promoting like super gangs as a way to get out of capitalism. I am seeing, saying that this section of the proletariat that saw nothing was gonna get better without coming together and coming together gets broader and broader and love gets broader and broader with some political ideas, uh, some amazing things could happen. And Hesu just published poetry from one of these people who's, you know, talks about learning and talks about love and talks about revolution. Yes, to the youth. Um, one person here is uh, uh, part of a poetry group. I taught poetry at the at the high school, or by taught, I was really a part of a collective with with young people. And so I really, the power and the support. I mean, we'd be there till ten at night. Like the, and it wasn't about poetry, right? It was about connection. And and there's so much that can be built from that. And I think I'm going to be thinking about Anthony's point about about rage and what Bell Hooks was talking about because I don't think. When any of us are saying love, we're like on this like nonviolent piece, sort of what we think of as like hippie. I think we're talking about deep love that includes conflict. I think we're talking about like love when everyone gets to be who they are, right? Like, and that's what liberatory love looks like. And, and so um, I think there's a lot to, to, to think about and unpack. Um, who else wants to share on this point of either what does it mean to be a revolutionary today or, you know, what does it look like day to day to be a revolutionary? I mean, either in terms of organizing or for you personally, or what's this all making you think of? What questions do you have? Any of that. Can I go a little bit more narrow? Um, I, I, you know, when we ask this question, we don't want to limit your thinking um, uh, in any particular way, but really giving you the freedom to really introspect and explore. But if I think um, in a, on a more narrow, um, in a more narrow way, you know, there's discussions, um, especially around the Black Lives Matter protests um, that was happening. Um, what revolutionaries actually are doing, right? Like, what does it mean to, uh, to be a revolutionary during during those times and and really these times now? Specifically, if I'm posting on social media. Am I a revolutionary about what's going on, right? Um, do I have to be out in the streets, right? Does that mean that does that only mean I'm a revolutionary if I'm out on the streets? Um, if I'm engaged in politics and I'm voting and I'm knocking on doors, right? Does that mean I'm a revolutionary? Like, what does it look like practically, right? The person that might be knocking on doors trying to get votes um might consider themselves to be revolutionaries or they might not right and they might not go into the streets but they might post about something political right so it's very nuanced so we really want to get a sense of like what does it mean to be a revolution how do like what do we think about this walter you want to jump in yeah, um, a couple of things. I mean, people have said this is a really rich discussion. Um, but, you know, in talking about the love, it's also day to day bringing an optimism and a hopefulness, right? That we can love is, love is about the process of birthing the new world right that that we are going to um be part of making a reality and i think it's really important that while we appreciate the urgency another quality of real love is patience you know and it's understanding you know people talked in the beginning about self-care and the trauma and so on and an accompaniment and so I think it's it's just understanding the complexity of um, all of the different realities, right? That that challenge each of us and then us collectively. But I think in the final analysis, it's what brings us together as humanity, right? In defense of of humanity and and the earth. And so um, it's 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 everything, you know. So, but how does that impact day to day? I think how we treat each other as revolutionaries, 
is really, really important, okay? You know, we can get really harsh and really like, you are supposed to do this and you are supposed to do this and you are supposed to do this. And it's like, oh my God, right? Do I have time to breathe? And so um, another thing, and there are some elder uh, comrades my age on here, division of labor. You know, to Anthony's point, you know, do you have to be in the street? Can you be the artist? Can you be the social media person? Can you be the educator in the classroom, in the street, in the, you know, can you be the tenant organizer? It's all of the above. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's also that division of labor, right? It's like not all of us have to do everything. And, and the collective allows us to take a deep breath, to step back and say, okay, I can do this now if you can. And, and you know, yeah, it, the task will be here tomorrow if neither of us can do it, you know? So, so yeah, I think it's just, it's a lot of things. To me, it's this collage, right? Of all of these comments that people have put in the chat and have shared here. Thank you, Alda. Uh, Lou, and then Rita, you're next. You're muted, Lou. That was an interesting metaphor at the end, Waldo, about the, about the collage. I guess we must be the Romare Beardens of, of uh, of uh, the revolutionary movement and in, in um, bringing together all the different and disparate aspects of, of it. But what I wanted to say was really uh, instigated by what Anthony was saying um, and that and in terms of the practicality and and yes, the fact that everybody has different uh, um, different people have different roles to play. But right now in Chicago, for example, I'll just raise this as a very practical question. Right now, revolutionaries have to consider what they're going to do in terms of electing a mayor. Are they going to, to stand for the first time for somebody who is likely to put together a program like Harold Washington did 40 years ago? Or are they going to stand for somebody else who will be a clearly outright fascist? And so revolutionaries have, a, have an opportunity at this point to come together in a way that we haven't had, you know, in 40 years. And I think that's a real interesting and really important um, fact. It doesn't mean that everybody goes out and knocks on doors or everybody phone banks, you know, everybody contributes in the way that they can to this motion, to this movement. And I say that because in the in the first stage of the election, only 32% voted. Compare that with 1983, when 87% of the people voted. Think of what that means, what kind of opportunity that is for revolutionaries today. And that's, uh, and that's what I have to say, and I'll go on mute again. Thank you, Lou. Um, yay, Brandon Johnson. Um, Rita, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think that if I recall the question, I think it had to do with practically what does it look like? Um, and and there's uh, and I think Lou obviously touched on that in terms of like practically how y'all going to do this piece in Chicago now. Um, one of the, uh, a few things. One is humility. Uh, I think a lot of people already said that in the chat. Um, the other thing is respecting space, re respecting protocols, respecting where you are. For example, here in Atlanta, we've got a major battle around Cop City. I'm sure most of you know that. Patrick, I hope you chime in on that. Uh, we know that there's a national mobilization and lots of folks are going to be coming to the South for that. Um, and we're happy for that. We're happy for that. But are they going to respect the local leadership? Are they going to follow uh, the local leadership here um, and the history that's been built up over years? Or are they going to do what they're going to do? And see, that's part of our struggle to get that 
get that understanding, particularly in the South and Appalachia, because there's, you know, we, we have to deal with issues of the way people characterize folk in the South and, and folks in Appalachia. Um, and it's, it's, it's another barrier uh, that's based on the history of this country. So that's one and two. And then the, the other thing, the other hopefully practical thing is you build a political act political collectivity wherever you go or whatever you do whatever the form is that you're moving in build that political collective get get you know where where you're sharing uh, ideas you're sharing work you're sharing understanding you're elevating uh the process up uh build political collectivity and thank you very much that's it <laughs> thank you rita jerome yeah, I think it's a very important point that was raised about the practicality of the moment, you know, and how we do, we do have to have a division on labor. We do not want everybody just to be thinking that they have to do the same thing because we don't. But what that, what that point brings up is that in order for that to be effective, it must be coordinated. And that's why we need a political apparatus, a revolutionary organization that coordinates that distribution of labor throughout society as a whole. Because the revolution is a society-wide process. And we need our tentacles in every section of society. But we got to have that revolutionary organization to coordinate it. Thank you, Jerome. I, yeah, on that same note, I want to, I want to kind of talk about it's it's hard facilitating and thinking to be honest. So I'm gonna do my best to get my thoughts together. But you know, all of these young people, I mean, not all of them, but I just see a ton on my social media, knowing that capitalism, deeply knowing that capitalism is wrong, and deeply feeling the effects of a fascism that the, the ruling class is using to maintain that control. But I don't know if they know what the other options are, right? And I think sometimes we're taught that like, okay, well, you just go to the street and you just, you lick envelopes and you do all of this. But without having that revolutionary education, it can feel like you're doing a lot, but you're not moving anywhere. So, and I think one of the things that like we get pushed back on the league as an organization is that like, we do a lot of education, but it's like learning is active. Education is active. This is like, you know, it's the thing that, that makes me excited about the world and about the future. So I think that as a practical day-to-day -day thing, understanding that there is something happening in our society right now that gives us the opportunity for something that's not capitalism, that's not fascism, that is communism, that is us saying that there are real solutions. I mean, it's not gonna be easy and it's not gonna just be us talking, but we have to understand what is happening in society. And that there's a whole new class of people created that don't have anything, that are useless to capitalists, that are useless to the ruling class and that there's power there, that there is going to be more unity amongst those people if we don't let the fascists get their claws in on like, um, you know, like we were talking about like poor white folks, if we can grab them and say like, hey, like the same thing is happening to you that's happening in Chicago, that's happening, like we are all fighting the same fight. We're fighting it differently. We have to capture the, those minds. So I think it is really important to note that we all do things differently. And there are real reasons behind. People have roles in their homes. They have caretaking roles. They have they're disabled. There's all different ways that we can all play a role. And we don't want to make people think that there's one way to be a revolutionary. Um, yeah, that, that's me, but I don't see anybody else. Who, who else? What do we got going on in the chat here? We got some Audrey Lord. Ooh, okay. Okay. So I'm going to need to hear that out loud again. Um, who Sinaya, else? Who else? Sinaya. Yeah. Sanaya, tell us. Please, you did a beautiful job speaking last time. She's saying she's having issues with her connection on her microphone. Maybe, you, okay. maybe you'd like to read it. Yeah, Sam, you want to go? Or you want me to go? Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Shania says, um, right. Lord. 
Audrey Lowe reminds us that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So in practice, to me, this means to constantly engage in rebellion, not being satisfied with everything we see, all the information we receive, to seek truth for yourself. Maybe you're not the person to speak in front of large crowds, but you can help your neighborhood with childcare or taking in their groceries. Maybe you aren't able to get time off to participate in a rally, but you can help to spread the word through social media or other outlets. Whatever the case may be, what we see practically in revolutionary thought and action day to day is the drive to always go beyond what we've been allowed to see and hear from the powers at be. Because at the end of the day, their goal is for the working class to remain in segregated subjugation. So we must be specific in how we move together and keep humanity ahead of us always in sight. Bro, I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> That was <laughs> can we quote that and reuse it for something? <laughs> I know, seriously, right? <laughs> Just uh, put it put it on the website, give it to the press. Um, I see a hand up, Joyce. Yeah, yeah. Um, amazing um, discussion. One thing that I've been thinking about in this discussion too is, and from my own sort of rumblings in my own self, is we, we need to have faith in a, a real process that we're a part of that is so much bigger than we can um, imagine. Um, we just, it's not just about consciousness or heart it's not it's not an either or i think part of our struggle going back to what somebody said earlier it's we tend to think in dualities we tend to think in either or not what we might say dialectically we as revolutionaries we may start in a very simple manner of anger at something we may not start in love we may not start in consciousness we may start practically or we may start impractically um you know and the question of our objective ability to be a part of this is one aspect of it our growing consciousness that this is a big thing and this break in continuity that we're experiencing right now in this revolution is so much bigger than, than, than we can imagine even historically. And, and just people have said humility, but you know, there are many, many people have struggled with hunger and and you know homelessness and uh, you know, dislocation. It's not, we're not the first ones. We're not the first ones that have been oppressed. We know this. So what is it that can allow us in this moment? to do what we we can do, like everyone's saying, not to do what we can't do, to do what we can do collectively that actually takes advantage, like Jerome and other people are saying, of a real objective possibility that is not something that's been in our grasp before. And that's going to require different people to give different things. But I think one of the first things that I think is important is to not set either each each of us against one another but also not to set history against current things not to set you know heart and mind i mean we're learning even with western science that these things are not the way they appeared <laughs> in previous periods so i just think part of the part of the exciting element to this and the love producing element of this is recognizing the real possibility as well as um, the necessity of, of, of our really doing what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Um, 
Michael, you've had some good response what you what you wrote in the chat. Could you share that out loud? Um, sure, Michael, he, him, Kentucky. Um, I was just kind of reflecting off of this one piece about um, this, this I think is definitely true. We, meaning revolutionaries, need to be out there and working and recruiting and involving poor and working class white people, particularly in the South and particularly in Appalachia. And there's a strategic reason for that. Um, uh, in Pikeville, Kentucky, organized neo-Nazis came to Pikeville, Kentucky before they went to Charlottesville. What they thought was this is a base that's that is struggling and pissed off about it. So they're ripe for recruitment. So I do think that we need to be in that turf um, and organizing for a liberated future and saying like, hey, you know, you're right, you are struggling um, and you're pissed and you got every right to be. And here's here's this other thing that's not the shit that the Nazis are trying to sell you on. Um, and while that's true, I think it's also true that it's 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 not like people around here are just like sitting around and like oh I could all <laughs> just go either way and I'm, I'm I'm just too dumb to really think this through and and just whoever comes knocking on my door and telling me a good story I'll go with that um there's also a lot that that people around here because we've had we have a long history of we meaning hillbillies have a long history of anti-capitalist and, and even revolutionary struggle. Um, some of it has been successful. We also have a history of horrific domination um, and and being overseers and, and all of these things. And, and both of that can be true at the same time. So we do want to like contend with the soil and and the history that we are coming from and also we we do have something to contribute to a revolutionary movement across the united states based on like um specific lessons that we've learned along the way um about how to fight we've got a lot of listening to do and a lot of learning from other people too but we we have a lot to be able to contribute as well and i, I just want to like um remember that kind of dynamic um because it, i think it's a little more complex than just like well there's a whole swath of people that are just out there and uh, we should go get them before the fascists do. It, it's also like we're lacking a piece of the solution, and and here are the folks that that can help with that. That might have a piece that that we're missing as revolutionaries. I think those are really important points. Thank you for uplifting them. Um, anyone else um, have any thoughts on either of these questions that we've posed? Before we start to wrap up, we have a couple asks of you, so don't get off when we say start to wrap up. All right, I don't see any hands up unless anyone, unless you want to call anybody out, Anthony. Hmm, who can I call out? <laughs> <laughs> no, All uh, right, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, let me just say some logistics before Anthony really like brings us home. Um, we need your help, right? We need um, help with social media. We're gonna be launching something called the Social Media Ambassador soon. Um, so if you have any video design experience or even just liking and sharing our content, if you don't take what we said in this conversation, do what you do. Don't think that you need to take on something new. We are all playing our role. Um, also, the rally is looking for writers. There is some talk in the chat about a couple of things that would make good articles. So um, you can reach out to us if you're interested in doing that. You can put your name and your email in the chat. And then we are going to do a next event on April 14th. Um, and that event will be a follow-up to this event. And we're looking for people to help us plan that event because this conversation has gone in a lot of different directions. So we'd like to work with you all to think about what those directions are. And then you can also donate to the organization. So we're gonna put those links um, in the chat as well as the evaluation um, link. But then Anthony's gonna kind of just 
just bring us home because we've had a lot of uh, big thoughts and ideas and uh, that's his specialty I like to think wow I, I'm, I'm in charge of that. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah I I, I just want to echo uh, the sentiment of love um, at the heart of this conversation because I think that it's really, really important to consider when we are asking questions about what it means to be revolutionary um, and what does it mean to uh, be a revolutionary in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, we have to keep love at the center of everything that we do. And I think that we've echoed that in so many different ways, right? Um, we know that love is an action word, right? Um, let us love not in word and talk, but in deed and in truth. Love is something that we do, right? And so, um, if I call you my comrade, if I call you my friend, if I call you my brother, right, we practice to be all the things that we want to be in life. We practice to be the best basketball player. We by, you know, going to conditioning, we practice to be the best track player by uh, running. We practice to be the best football player by doing scrimmages or whatever they do in football. Um, and, and we have to practice being the best, best brothers, the best sisters, um, the best comrades that we can be by finding out ways to love our comrades that much more, right? And it requires listening, it requires learning, and it requires uh, using all of that um, in our behavior to treat one another better, right? And so I think that's super, super important. And when I think about the league, I think about it being a home to do just that, right? We can't find consciousness in a vacuum, right? Um, love is so communal. And here in the League of Revolutionaries for our new America, love is what we do, right? And so we welcome all of you to continue to walk with us in this journey towards liberation.